Uh, well, hi everyone. My name is Izzy. Um, this is a workshop on getting research internships as a high schooler, um, titled Astrophysics Researcher, but make it a high schooler. Very cool title, I know, thank you. Um, and yeah, um, Chloe says to go ahead and get started, so I shall. All right, so thank you all so much for joining me. I am so happy to be here. Um, I wanted to, to get to know you guys a little bit before getting started, but I'll first start off by introducing myself a little bit more. Um, okay, so who am I? Great question. Uh, my name is Izzy. I am 17 years old and I'm from New York City. I'm a graduate of LaGuardia Arts High School. If that name sounds familiar, that's probably because a lot of big stars went there, such as Timothy Chalamet. I know some of you guys are Timmy stands because like, I feel like everyone our age is. Um, and Nicki Minaj, um, Jarrell Jerome, Ansel Elgort, who we hate, but he did go there, I'm not gonna lie. Um, okay, and I am an incoming freshman at Barnard College of Columbia University. Um, if anyone is not familiar with Barnard, Barnard is the women's college of Columbia University. So we have all of the same resources as Columbia, except we get a really freaking dope campus to ourselves when we don't feel like talking to Columbia people. Um, I am also the co-founder and CEO of First Empower, which is a business I started with a couple of my friends dedicated to empowering young girls through STEM. Um, I also recently joined If Then's Girls Advisory Council. They're a really cool nonprofit um, dedicated to, to, you know, exposing more girls to STEM. Um, something else that's not on here, but I'm also a Code with Classy 2020 scholar. I'll be in the um, August 3rd to 14th web development camp, so I'm super excited for that. Um, I'm really involved with Girl Genius. Uh, shout out you guys for this amazing conference. I've been member of Girl Genius magazine since issue one. So that's pretty cool. I was the issue two writing director as well. I'm also involved with Generation She, which is a really cool nonprofit. I'm sure a lot of you guys have heard of it if you haven't, um, but they are dedicated to closing the gender gap on the entrepreneurial landscape. And one last fun fact about me before we get more into this uh, workshop is that I have 100 digits of pi memorized. So if you guys ever want to know 100 digits of pi, um, I got you. Uh, let's talk space. Um, I think that before I really get into my internship, I wanted to tell you guys a little bit about my background and my STEM story, um, which has all led me to get this internship in the first place. Um, and space is kind of my whole thing. So. I made a little timeline if she wants to load. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, all right. So my love for space, um, if uh, space astrophysics, you know, it's all, it's, all, it's all one thing that we're studying here. Um, so I first became really interested um, in STEM. My story begins when I was eight years old um, and I became fascinated by physics. And I often tell this anecdote when I'm telling my STEM story um, because it was just like a really important little thing that happened in my life. Um, so I was walking with my mom um, in the street in Brooklyn. I live in New York again. Um, and I noticed a car moving really fast. And you know, I say for no reason, wow, that car's moving really fast. And my mom responds saying, well, it's fast only relative to what you're comparing it to. And my grandfather was a biophysicist. So my mom grew up with a lot of physics in her household. And this one sentence really just like literally shifted my entire perception on how I view the world. And I began thinking like, oh, wow, okay. Like things are relative to what you're comparing them to. And, you know, I can say from my perspective that this random object is moving at this speed, but to someone else, it doesn't look the same way. And this kind of questioning my surroundings and just like, you know, looking at the world and not just accepting it for the way it is really being like, okay, wow, like, why does it work like that? And how does it work like that? Um, eventually took to the stars, um, is what I say, um, when I went to my first planetarium visit. Um, so if you guys are not familiar with planetariums, there are these really cool dome-like things that museums um, often have that have, you know, a whole space, uh, they have like a whole space section in them. And I, you know, you can go into them and you look up and there's like a projected universe basically. And you lie there and it literally feels like you're just like floating around in space. And it's one of the coolest sensations ever. And I went to my first planetarium at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, which is now the place where I actually have just finished conducting my research 10 years later. So it's really cool that the place that I fell in love with 
um, space in the first place is now the place that I've been able to conduct my research. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how my story begins. Um, and then I skip all the way to sophomore year, obviously, you know, between age eight and age 15, I'm taking STEM classes in school, you know, not always doing my best, which if you're interested in hearing more of the specifics of my STEM story, I posted a video on my Instagram that goes around to death. My Instagram is at Izzy Lapidus, which it'll all be linked at the end. Um, but it was really sophomore year when I started to read a lot, you know, I thought to myself, well, I've liked astrophysics since I was eight years old and I haven't really done anything about it. So what can I do to learn? Well, I can read. So I bought this like huge stack of books by different cough male mm, physicists. And I began reading a lot. And I would basically have a book in my backpack. Um, I live, my, my house is 45 minutes away from my school. So I would go on the, the train every day. And I'd always, I'd always have a book on me and I always be reading um, something to learn about physics or to learn about the universe. And then I started this journal that I call the educate yourself uh, notebook or journal and I bring my my notebook around with me everywhere whenever I'm reading I'd also be taking notes and writing down everything I was learning and I am a big bullet journal stand love a good love a nice love a nice note taking session you know you feel me um and so you know not only was I creating this like really dope re uh, astrophysics resource but it was also really aesthetically pleasing and really cute um and it was my it was it, it was you know the beginning of when I started on my mission of really learning about space. And then um, in the junior year, in fall, I began taking classes at the museum where I now conduct my research or finish conducting my research. Um, and the museum, you know, I'm so lucky that I had this resource that was so, uh, you know, it was only, you know, it was, it was in New York City where I lived that I was able to take these classes. And I took, they have tons of really amazing, they have a really amazing after school program with life science classes, physical science classes, also anthropology classes. Um, and I took my first actual astronomy class called Secrets of the Solar System. Um, and this was really cool. And it was, um, and then these classes um, were actually the prerequisite classes for shrimp otherwise known as the Science Research Mentoring Program, which is the program through which I've been able to conduct my research. So in junior spring, as you can see on the timeline, I applied to SHRIMP and I got in, yay. Um, and I'll go more into depth about you know, what, what that was like in the next slide. Um, so one addition, so not only with SHRIMP do you get to conduct research, but you also have the whole SHRIMP Summer Institute. So over my junior summer, I took one um, observational astronomy class at Harvard through Harvard Summer Secondary School program. So that was seven weeks of class. And then uh, I had about three days to relax. And then I came back to New York City and boom, I was in a three week summer research institute for my internship. Um, and this was really cool. It was my first time ever actually learning data science and, you know, everyone uses Google Sheets, but like Google Sheets is a lot more than like an organization platform. It's actually an entire uh, computer program. And, you know, we, we learned all these special commands and functions. And it was really, really cool. And then we had two weeks of that just learning, you know, how actually do scientists record data. Um, and then we had a week at the uh, we were like in upstate New York doing field science. Um, we, we added to an ongoing study of turtles in the area. It was really cool. Um, and it wasn't that much space. It wasn't that much looking at any telescopes. We looked at them like one eye, but um, a lot of just like science in general, which is also really cool. Um, and then senior year uh, began. So in the fall, in September, I was matched with Johanna. Um, so the way my internship works is that you got matched, you got to you got, there was like, you know, there's a bunch of scientists that are that are all in the program um, and that and you get matched with, you can rank them and then you get matched with one of them. So I matched with Johanna. I'll talk a little bit more about her more in the next um, slide. And uh, she was my first choice, which was really exciting. And then my internship began in the uh, in September and I have just now finished the final element of it, my research paper. Um, we have turned it in. So that's about 10 months of, of real research being done. Um, so that's a little timeline. And then um, what exactly is my internship? Um, so I just wanted to kind of give you guys a little bit of context, um, but now I want to talk about, okay, what, am, what actually have I been doing for the past 10 months? So here is a summary. Um, so as I said, I conducted research under Johanna Voss, um, who is a postdoctoral uh, astrophysics fellow at the American Museum of Natural History um, through SHRIMP, the Science Research Mentoring Program. And this is a program that is specific to high school juniors and seniors in New York City. 
Um, and as you can see, it's a pretty selective program. There's about 60 spots available, 40 for life science students and 20 for physical science students, which is um, what astronomy is or astrophysics is. Um, so that's where I, uh, that's, that, that is where I came in. I was one of those 20, 20, 20 spots. Um, and what's really cool about shrimp and what is so cool about, you know, a research internship is that it's real research being done by real scientists. You know, it's not a simulation. It's not you being like, well, this is what, what we would be doing if this was, you know, actually an object in space. No, like you're actually adding to ongoing scientific research and you as a high schooler are making an impact in the scientific community. And that is just like a really dope thing to know. Um, so a little bit about how it worked. Uh, my team consisted of me plus two junior boys. Um, that emoji is only there because they're boys, nothing against them. They were great. They were really good to work with, but you know, I just felt like being edgy. Um, and then we have Johanna, who I loved. As I said, she was really, really cool. She was my first choice. I really wanted to study under a young woman. Um, a lot of what I'm always preaching is that, you know, we have this idea of a scientist is like an old white dude with crazy hair and glasses, you know, an Einstein type guy. And I am all about breaking that stereotype. And Johanna is a really great example of not that. Um, and so she's super young and was really, really amazing to work under. So what exactly am I doing for my research? Okay. So if you read the little um, summary of what this workshop is on, I conducted research on round dwarfs, which are these really cool celestial objects that have masses in between planets and stars. So they kind of fall, you know, if we have a little, you know, uh, boundary here, round dwarfs make up, you know, this area and here, if this is planets and this is stars, they fall in the middle somewhere. And um, what's cool about studying them is that you get to learn information about both stars and about planets. And what we were doing was we were looking at data of these brown dwarfs taken um, by the VLT. So that stands for the Very Large Telescope. Yes, that is actually what uh, this telescope is called. And astronomers are not very creative, apparently. Um, and this data was taken in 2013 by this guy named Ben Pope. Um, and he was... Um, you know, he collected all this data and then did nothing with it of these brown dwarfs. So we got to, to take a second look at this data. And how we were able to analyze our data is by creating our own code in Python. That emoji is there because it was my first time using Python and she was difficult, but you know, we made it. Um, and uh, we created our code that was able to analyze these images. And I don't want to go too in depth about all of that. It's you know, complicated stuff that's going on there. Um, but we were basically able to take an image that wasn't that clear and through coding, um, make it a whole lot more clear so we could actually look at what the image was of. And our overall goal was to find brown dwarf binaries. So binaries or brown dwarf binaries in this case are when there's two brown dwarfs and they orbit each other. Um, and this guy, Ben Pope, right? We know Ben Pope over here. He took all of this data um, of these potential brown dwarf binary candidates, it's what they're called. And he takes all of them, gets all these images, and then it's like, okay, it doesn't do anything with it for what, seven years? So that's why Johanna was like, whoa, 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 uh, let me and my team take a look at it. So that's what we did. That's what we created our program to do. And then we looked at three different brown dwarf binary candidates. So me and the other two boys, we each had our own that we were analyzing with our code. And we've actually found a binary. So it was actually my object that I was looking at, 2M2351A, that turned out to be both 2M2351A and 2M2351B. So we actually found a binary, which is really cool. Um, and you know, if you look on any databases, it says that this object is only one, but we have the proof that it is two. Um, so that's kind of what we based our entire Prod, uh, our entire uh, research around when we created a poster, a paper, and a talk to exhibit our findings. Um, you know, the main finding was that, you know, we didn't find binaries for these two objects, but that we did find one for this object. So that was a lot of talking. Um, that is a little summary of my research. Obviously, you know, I can't fit 10 months worth of <laughs> research onto one slide, but I hope that you guys are going to be able to learn a little bit more when I show you uh, my poster, paper, and talk. So with that, let's take a closer look. So as I said, we created a poster, a paper, and a talk. Um, and I thought it was helpful that, to, to tell you guys this, to show you guys this, because you know, 
there's different ways that astronomers or scientists in general go about presenting um, when they have actually made a discovery. Um, and even when they just want to present their research, even if they haven't made a discovery, right? Um, there's different ways that as scientists, we can show our work. Um, and my, I was so lucky through this program that we got to do all three. So one way, as I said, is we showed off our work through our poster. So our poster was a summary of our research. I'm going to show you guys what all three of these look like next, but you know, a poster must include a title, introduction, methods, results, conclusion. You know, if you've ever done like a science fair, it's a similar situation to that. And you know, it has to be really easily digestible. Less text, the better, right? And this is something that you know is not normally required, but it is required if I ever do any research, which is a nice color scheme, aka pink and purple, because you see all of these research posters and they are ugly, okay? Not just by, you know, they're not organized extremely well, that's part of it, but like the colors, bro, like I am trying to look, I'm trying to learn about science and anything STEM related with pink and purple because that, not, in my opinion, makes everything a whole lot more fun. Um, and so I made sure that our poster and really everything that we ended up also our not our not our not our paper, but our talk is colorful and exciting. Um, and this would make us, you know, for our poster in particular, stand out in the poster session, which is um, some normally at any presentation, you know, you'll be able to go around and look at what other people are are have done their research on and you know, you, whatever poster sessions aren't relevant to what I'm talking about. Um, okay, so moving on. Uh, we also wrote our paper. So this is the fanciest element of our research. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard of a research paper, but um, when it's, uh, you know, I've, I've only done a research paper um, on in history. So I've never, I, I've never had an experience like this in school. Maybe some of you guys have, um, but this is the most detailed recount of our work. Um, and our goal is not to make it, you know, we want to be concise, but we want to really explain in depth, what do we really do here? Um, and we wanted our writing to be sophisticated enough so that it could be published and submitted to scientific journals, right? Because we actually made a discovery here. Like, not that that always happens, but in our case, we wanted it to be extra sophisticated so that um, it would get um, approved to be, to be redistributed. And this was about uh, 2,000 words. Then the last element um, of, our, of, my, of my internship was that we had a talk. And this was a way for us to creatively show off our research in our own voices. So it was really more of a video, but in real life, you know, had coronavirus not hit, we would have been giving our talk to the entire science research colloquium. So that's what other uh, students in New York City, other high schoolers that were also conducting research. Um, and our goal for our talk was that we wanted it to be concise, right? Because, you know, if I, if I was gonna talk for 30 minutes about my research, people would get bored, I would get bored, I get it. So we wanted it to be concise. So we managed our talk to be only about six minutes in all. And our goal is that anyone can watch and will understand our project. Um, so I'm actually gonna play you guys my talk. So hopefully, you know, uh, I guess you guys will be the judge of that. Um, and overall, we want it to be captivating and fun to watch. Okay, so this is what a poster looks like. We don't need to spend time reading this, but I did want, to got, want you guys to see what it looks like. As I said, we got the color scheme going on. We display our uh, research in a way that is easy to understand, digestible, concise, captivating. Um, if you're interested in getting a closer look at this, please let me know after. Um, and then this is what our paper looks like. So please do not try to read this. That is not the goal, but I did want to show you guys that this is, you know, this looks, this looks sophisticated. This looks like adults could have written this. Um, and that's our goal. So as once again, you know, we have images of our, re of our results, just like we had in the poster. Um, and then we have an abstract at the beginning there, um, which is basically just a summary of your research in the smallest form um, and, you know, nicely labeled, all that jazz, title, discovery of a brown dwarf binary, and there we go. All right, so now let's see if this works. I want to play you guys my talk, which is um, about six minutes, and then after that we'll get into more how and why I got my internship and then more specific advice for you guys. So let's see if this works. Hello and welcome to our talk, everyone. Today we will be telling you about our discovery of a brown dwarf binary. My name is Izzy Lapidus, and I am a senior at LaGuardia High School. Hi, my name is Otis McCallum, and I'm a student at Beacon High School in New York City. Oh, hey, I'm William McCartney. We conducted our research under Johanna Voss, a postdoctoral fellow here at the museum and a member of BDNYC, which is the largest brown dwarf research group in the world. We are so grateful to have studied under Johanna and have gained so much from our experience in the STRIM program. Let's get started. Okay, so to begin, 
let me first tell you a little bit about brown dwarfs. So brown dwarfs are these really cool celestial objects with masses in between planets and stars. So by studying them, we learn information about both. Now, astronomers speculate that brown dwarfs form in a similar fashion to stars, but they actually look and seem a lot more like planets. So yeah, astronomers think that they form in a similar fashion to stars, but we do not have a clear and refined evolutionary model of brown dwarfs, which is why our research is so important. Currently, there is no clear understanding of brown dwarf binarity, the nature of brown dwarf pairs, triplets, and so on. Um, Pope et al. 2013 used the Hubble Space Telescope to estimate the fraction of brown dwarf binarities to determine the likely formation pathway of brown dwarfs. This study produced a list of possible brown dwarf candidates. It could not be confirmed due to the limited resolution and size of the Hubble telescope. Our team is continuing the studies of Pope et al. 2013 uh, using new data, if the binary fraction is higher than previously thought, it will mean that the current evolutionary models, which predict temperatures, radii, luminosities, and masses of brown dwarfs are inaccurate. The challenge that comes with examining brown dwarfs is that they're very small and dim. So we need to account for both of these factors. To view an object as small and far away as a brown dwarf, we need to use a telescope with a large enough diameter. So we are using the VLT or Very Large Telescope very creative name, based in northern Chile. It's important that the resolution is high enough because if it's too low, we won't be able to tell if a brown dwarf light source is a binary or not. Another thing is brown dwarfs shine much more brightly in the infrared spectrum rather than the visible light. So we are using a special instrument on the VLT called the NACO, which takes infrared images. The heart of our work involves refining raw images taken of the binary candidates with the VLT to determine whether or not they're actual binaries. Um, our team focused on three of these candidates, uh, one of which was observed twice, and uh, used Python to write the pipeline reducing these images. Um, to reduce these images, we had to obtain uh, science, flat, and dark images. The data reduction pipeline is composed of three major steps that are common in infrared astronomy, bad pixel masking, sky subtraction, and flat field correction. The first step in the data reduction sequence, bad pixel masking, aims to flag malfunctioning pixels and discard them. Following bad pixel masking, sky subtraction is the name given to the process of removing atmospheric effects from pictures taken by ground telescopes. Uh, this is mostly done when taking uh, infrared images of the sky as the sky is really bright in that wavelength. Finally, flat field correction removes the pixel to pixel sensitivity variations that are made clear by our flat image. Um, producing our final science quality image. As you can see, our target is now at its clearest. Okay, so we are now moving on to objectively the most exciting part of our talk, our results. So pictured above me are three different images um, of two brown dwarfs. So on the left, we have 2M0045, and on the middle and the right, we have 2M0036, which is the same brown dwarf, an image of which was taken on two separate nights. All of these images were resolved using the KS filter, and as you can see, each of these only has one object in them. So although we did not discover any companions for the objects pictured in the first row, we did discover a companion to 2M2851A, 2M2851B, which is pictured in the second row. So this is super, super, super exciting. And we originally saw that when we resolved an image of 2M2851A using the KS filter pictured on the left, we saw that there was not one, but two objects there. So then our team's goal was to find as much information as we could about the entire system. So to start off, we resolved the system, uh, we resolved the image of the system using the H filter to confirm that there were two objects. And as you can see, looking at the image on the right of the second row, there were two. So this is super, super, super exciting. In conclusion, we examined three brown dwarf binary candidates using the Very Large Telescope and we're able to find a brown dwarf binary and the new brown dwarf 2M2351b. We further revealed that the binary system is approximately 66 light years away from our own sun. Not only that, but we even found out that the two brown dwarfs orbit each other at around 4.8 astronomical units. 
which is strikingly similar to Jupiter's five astronomical unit distance from our sun. In the future of this research, we would examine more candidates and further determine the accuracy of our multiplicity rate of brown dwarfs. Okay, so that was that. Uh, yes, shout out William, he's a G. He edited that entire video. Um, he is a pretty cool guy. Um, okay, so that was the, that's kind of the end of me actually talking about my research now. This is, the rest of this is more about, I mean, actually, just kidding. That was the end of me showing my research. Um, okay, so now a little bit on to, you know, less the content, but um, more the how and why of how I got my internship. Also, if you have any questions about anything that you've seen so far, please let's save them for the end because I do want to have time for questions at the end. So I'm going to try to speed things up a little bit. So how and why I got my internship. Um, and then we'll go into more specific advice for you guys. So the big three reasons was that my school straight up did not have what I was trying to do. Um, as I said, I go to LaGuardia, that's an art school, and there really just weren't that many STEM opportunities. So this led me to be proactive, right? I said to myself, well, if my school is not going to have everything I want, then I'm going to have to go outside of school and look for ways to get involved in what I want to get involved in. Um, so then that brings me to research. So I said, I really want to get into STEM today. I love astrophysics and I wanna be doing astrophysics today. So how can I? So I took a look around, right? Um, and I talked more about how to go about actually researching a little, a little bit on, but you know, obviously Google, but also friends and just people in your community, right? I was like, uh, I like what exists um, near, near, near me that I can get involved in us at a school, right? Um, so then I was able to do some uh, research and I came across, you know, on Google and my friend Linus, um, and I was able to get discover shrimp um, and was like, oh my gosh. Um, and then I think, you know, the big why I got this internship was my passion, right? When you're doing anything, you want your application to stand out. I always say that the way to make your application stand out is with passion, real authentic passion shows. And I say favorite word, we'll touch on this later, which I do. Um, but yeah, you know, these are hard. A lot of people want to get research internships. They're pretty selective. I said, you know, I'm one of 20 students that are in the program that, that I just graduated from, which means that you need to take your passion. And even if it's up there in your head, even if like, okay, yes, I'm really passionate, you need to figure out how to best show that on the paper. And I talk about that more as we keep going. Um, so I wanted to talk a little about like what I gained from this experience, because I think that it is beneficial. Um, to talk about what you learn from really anything you do in life ever. Um, so quick answer, a lot, right? Um, I think the main thing right off the bat is that I didn't want to be a full-time researcher. I mean, up until the time I had my internship, I was like, yep, okay, astrophysics, that's my thing. Like I'm gonna, you know, become a professor of astrophysics and I'll conduct research on the side. And like, that will be my life. And I learned from doing this that that isn't actually what I wanna do. But I also learned that I really love talking to people about science in space. And that I also really enjoyed writing our actual paper. Um, and that is super cool to take with me, right? After, after this is over. Um, I also learned that having been acting my entire childhood, that that's really helpful. Um, that I'm actually able to communicate science in a way that you know, is often not how science is communicated because I know how to talk to people. That's what acting keeps you out to do. Acting is simply communicating with people on stage and moving an audience off stage. Um, and I also learned that being an astrophysicist is basically being a computer scientist. Like I really did not see how interdisciplinary STEM really is until this internship because I talk about it, right? We spent a ton of time on our computer. Our actual research was creating a code that could analyze images from a telescope. Whereas you think of astrophysics as, you know, all, all things space and nothing on the computer necessarily. Well, that is a really big misconception. A lot of astrophysics is literally just computer science. Um, and yeah, so I learned the important, importance of coding for sure. And I also learned that people get like really freaked out whenever they hear someone talk about space. Like if any of the other uh, students in my program were talking about like their life science research, like people would be like, ah, oh, like not freak out. But you know, I say the word brown dwarf and everyone like runs away. So <laughs> there's that. Um, and then something else I really wanna point out is connections guys. Like 
that is what is so amazing about getting an internship or getting, you know, anything really in life, right? You have connections now from it. So I now have an entire cohort of scientists at the museum that I can message whenever. Maybe I want to bring them in for a product I'm working on, a project I'm working on. I want to have real scientists talk about the research. Well, I have literally a whole program full of them now. Um, they also have contacts to the entire youth edu education department at the museum, which is awesome. Um, and now I know so many people my age in New York City that are all interested in STEM. Um, and that is also really awesome. And as I say down there, everyone is a future collaborator. Um, everyone's a future business partner, right? Like I want you guys to go throughout life with that lens that everyone you meet can somehow aid you in your journey or you can aid them in their journeys, right? That we're all trying to do cool stuff in life and why not be doing it together? Um, all right, so how does this relate to you? Amazing question. So I think the thing that I really wanna make clear before I get into more specifics is that you can gain a lot from these internships and that they're really worth pursuing in high school. Um, I know for me, I thought until I really got this internship that my, my time to, to do scientific research would be college. And that's, that's a misconception. These, these programs are out there. It's not this only one specified program that I found in New York City. They exist, they involve taking the time to really look for them, you know, do that research, uh, do those applications, send those cold emails, but they are out there and um, they are definitely to be pursued. And as I said, if I hadn't had mine, I probably still wanna become a professional astrophysicist. Um, so that was my experience. That was me, what I gained from it, you know, that I, I learned that this, you know, what I was doing was not what I wanted my career necessarily to be, but that might not be the case for you. You might have your internship and you're like, oh my God, I have found it. I have found my passion in life. This is it. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And that is so fucking cool, right? My journey is going to look completely different than yours. This was my experience with my internship. Um, and I, um, you know, yours will, will maybe will be similar to mine, maybe totally different. All right, so let us talk advice. So if you have not had your notebook and pencil or iPad Pro or any note-taking situation on you, I recommend now is the time to get that out because um, here's where I go into specifics. So starting off, I think step one is define your goals, right? What are you hoping to gain from this experience? Do you want to have lab experience? That wasn't what mine was, but some of my friends were spending, you know, every Tuesday and Wednesday after school in a lab at the museum. Do you want an in-person or remote experience? You know, this is for long-term, right? Not just, you know, recent, like what I'm saying now is for the rest of your life, not hopefully when coronavirus is not a thing. Um, and, you know, another, another question, will this boost your career or will this boost your resume or help your career? Do you want to get paid? I didn't mention it, but I actually got paid one thousand dollars for my for the research I was doing. Um, so I think what I want to get at is you want to think both long and short term goals, right? Long more as you know, well, or short more like you know, will this help? Um, will will I gain you know an experience that will help me uh, you know in the next thing I do, or is this what I'm curious about right now? Like that's more of um, you know, a short-term goal, just something that is tangible right now that I could gain from this experience. Whereas long-term is like, okay, you know, this might be really, really amazing to have on my resume in the future. And that is such a great reason to pursue something, right? So after you thought about your goals, and I mean like really thought about them for a hot sec there, I want you to get specific. I want you to ask yourself, what skill sets can you bring to the table? Why would someone want to work with you? Why are you interested in that particular field? And I want you to practice writing about yourself and your interests to really highlight your strengths. Because when it comes down to it, it's either an email or an application, right? That is how you're gonna land this internship. And if you cannot put all of that amazing stuff that you know about yourself that's up there in your head onto paper and really be so specific about what you have to offer, the other person on the other end is not gonna, is not gonna see it. Um, so that's on you to figure out your goals and to get specific. And then I want you to actually do the research, right? We always say that Google is your best friend. So I want you, I implore you actually, to search for high school research opportunities in your area, right? Do a deep dive into work being done at museums, that was like in my case, or universities around you, which is more common. Um, and then after you've done that, after you've really taken the time to do research to, right, you know, you, you found your goals, you know what you can, what you can bring to the table. Now you know what you're looking for. Now you know what you want. 
So now you have to do the work to match or align your goals and your strengths with research that is being done in your area or possibly remotely. Um, and then to continue, um, you gotta stay organized. Um, when you're doing anything in life, organization is always key, but especially with getting a research internship, it's really important that you have a spreadsheet where you're keeping track of links of, of projects or of, you know, stuff being done in your area that are that really sparks your interest. And, you know, if there is the research being done at a university near you, that's really cool. Okay, awesome. Record the name um, of the professor and their email, because that might be what you end up seriously pursuing, right? At first, our goal is not to nail it down. What exactly do we want right this very moment? We're just, we're browsing. We're browsing the internet. We're seeing the vibes. Um, and just, you got to just keep track of all of that. And also make sure that for any possible opportunity that you're writing down the necessary experience and skill set. Because let's say you fall in love with X, but then you need like A, B, C, and D skill sets that you do not have. X is going to say peace when they, you know, read your email, right? So know what you actually, you know, know what these um, opportunities require of you so that you can see if you can bring that to the table. And as I say at the bottom there, you know, keep your goals and your strengths in mind throughout this whole process. And then we get to securing the bag, right? This is where the magic happens. Now we want to narrow down these, these different opportunities that we found and really take the next steps or take the first steps. So maybe that's writing an email, maybe that's writing a cold email, or maybe that's filling out an application. Regardless of what it is, you need to show off your interests, show off your strengths, and make sure to explain what you really hope to gain from this experience. Regardless of what you know, the thing actually is, you're gonna have to, you're gonna be asked that in some way or another. So you really have to know once again back to your goals what you want to gain from this. And I said at the bottom, as I mentioned before, authentic passion reads, y'all. Like it straight up does. Um, but to have that authentic passion read, you got to know what you bring to the table. You got to know what you're in the market for. It's really just doing this, this initial work to figure out your goals and your strengths that really set you up for success. So bang, now you have secured the bag. Let's say you got that internship, right? You know, fast forward a couple months from now, congrats, you have secured the bag. So now it's time for you to get your listening ears on brain ready to absorb tons of new info and your phone out to write down contacts because regardless of whether this internship is going to be what you know impacts your entire life and that this is the this, you found your you found your niche this is what you want to do or in my case you kind of found what you don't necessarily want to do amazing because regardless of which one of those it is you just made the first step in the career of your dreams and that is always to be applauded um and after the end of your work is up it's really important that you ask your mentor or mentor really goes for whatever this internship ends up being for recommendation letter because they have seen you work. They have seen you doing something that you're passionate about, which means they know firsthand how, how you work and they can help you land your next internship. And as I said, to reiterate, everyone you meet is a future collaborator, regardless of what it is. I need you to go through life with that mentality because you will just have so much success and see so much success in just the people around you. <sighs> oh my God, that was a lot of talking. <laughs> okay, so now it is Q&A time. Um, we have, how much time? Okay, cool. So we have about 12 minutes. Um, if you do not have any questions for me, that's cool. Um, I guess you can hang still or go and do whatever you wanna do. Um, before you leave, um, I'm just gonna put this slide up um, to, <laughs> let's have this load, please. Okay, don't load, let's load nice and slow. Um, this is my contact information. Um, please make sure to follow me on Instagram. I wanna stay connected with you guys. That's my email, hello at itsylapidus.com. Um, if you wanna learn more about First Empower, that's the uh, website to, uh, that's what you should type into your search bar. Um, and yeah, um, I guess I'll keep this slide up um, and I'll start answering some questions. Um, actually, I guess that we can just, um, you guys can just come unmute yourself and ask me a question. Um, can I ask a question? Yeah. Um, so if we don't necessarily get an actual re uh, internship opportunity, if we've, um, look for a professor at a university and 
work with them, would that also look good on our college application? Yes, absolutely. That is that is a research internship. Um, if you're the what a research internship really is is adding to ongoing actual research being done. So professors are often always conducting actual research aside from teaching. Um, so yes, that would look fantastic on an application. That is definitely one of the ways I hope that the advice I gave here will be applied into working under professors or studying under professors. Okay, thank you. Um, I had a question actually. So I. I don't really live in like a super huge STEM city and from, from what I've seen like there's a lot of programs and like research happening at the collegiate level but they don't open it up like due to the nature of like the study to high school is really like okay. life science is like bioengineering they're like nope you're nope no nope, not for you I'm like okay fine but um in terms of like finding actual like museums there's definitely opportunities like you know I mean like databases I guess shortlisted type things because like I've tried before but Google can be really overwhelming sometimes and um, yeah, so do you know of any, I guess, really commonly used websites or things where you can find some resources like on a local level, a little bit yeah, easier? I, I guess that's pretty hard for me to answer because my experience with, with you know, research internships as are what is in New York City. Um, mm -hmm. So I think my best thing that you want to, what, what I want to say is just in actually what you're Google searching to just get as specific as possible. To get as specific as possible, you want to know, okay, like, you can even put in like, you know, once you figured out your skill set, right, as I say to do, mm -hmm. you can say, okay, um, research, science research op, um, experiences for girls ages this that um, have this specific skill set, you know, like break it mm -hmm. down as much as you can, because yeah, Google can kind of like, not always be the most helpful, which is why it's so important that you know exactly what you're looking and even so, maybe this takes a lot of work. Maybe this takes a lot of going through Google and really reading through, you know, what is existing out there. But if you're able to know if you've done that work before to say, this is what I want to gain and this is a skill set that I have, you will be able to find something that aligns with, with your goals and your um, strengths. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Um, I'm Rahima Jasmine from India. Okay. Hi. Internships, uh, I'm from India. How to get research internships from foreign countries? Because uh, internships in India are too less. So, um, unfortunately, I do not really know exactly. Um, I, um, I think it really, once again, I mean, I want to say, I think being the most specific that you can be is always best, right? Um, I think for you, you should, I mean, uh, is your goal definitely to to do research in America? Um, are there not like something that you'd be interested in doing in India? I'm ready to do in America too, but um, yeah, I mean, I think that my best, the best thing I can say is just to get really specific with what you're looking for and just say, I mean, I guess what I guess would you you you'd want to do something remote? I assume. Yeah. I'm really inter interested in astrophysics. I just um, completed my high school. Yeah. Um, then I think that you can, I think what I would say to you is to look into what um, different universities are doing. Maybe like more, um, if you like pick a specific city that has uh, research going on, that's maybe like more specific to that, to that city. Um, and you can just get, you know, once again, with their Google searches, I mean, I don't have like a recipe or really have that much experience with conducting things inter or, uh, internships internationally. Um, okay. But I think for any internship, they're really it's really the same things that consistently apply, right? Knowing what you want to gain and knowing what your skill sets are and then going out of your way to find those opportunities that they got to exist. I promise you that they do. It just takes a lot of specific Google searching to find them. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, can I ask a question? Yes. Sorry if I'm like lowering my voice, it's 3.30 a.m. here, oh, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But do you have any recommendations, like um, any challenges or contests that um, uh, we can do for beginners in a uh, astrophysics or astronaut? Um, sorry, my yeah, brain is not um, working, it's so early. <laughs> Yeah, no, you're, you're good, bro. Um, so I don't know off the top of my head anything. Um, 
that's kind of with astrophysics it's like kind of hard to find really beginner stuff often like that's why um I would say that something you can look into is what which is why I've been successful you know sometimes museums have like youth education programs that are put in place which means they have more beginner um like education that they're offering um so because like that's why I was able to get my internship because there's a really big focus on youth obviously beginner education um, at the museum where there's an entire astrophysics research department. So I would say, look, um, maybe like what you're Googling then is, you know, what are places, like what are institutions that offer, um, that, that, that have opportunities that are more targeting, um, you know, people that are not experienced and just want to. <laughs> yeah. Well, all right, thank you so much. Loved your talk, by the way, you were oh, awesome. amazing. Dude, I oh, stand, okay. I stand. Oh, amazing. That makes me so happy. Thank you so much for coming. Okay. Hi, I have a really quick question. Yes, shoot. So um, I have a friend who has like a computer science internship and I think like um, she's ranted to me, I guess, but um, I th think she feels like she isn't making the most of it because they haven't been like giving her access to the code and they're like, um, it, they've just kind of been like disconnected and it's been like a remote internship. So do you have any tips for like, how can she, she how she can stay like more involved or yeah, like try I, to get into I there? think she should speak up, right? She wants to be more involved and she should say that she wants to be more, more involved. I don't know if she's, you know, actively been reaching out and being like, I would like to be more involved, but just, you know, if she's able to say, I mean, back to skill sets once again, right? If she's able to say, hey, like these are, you know, three things that I'm able to do um, that I looked forward to doing when I got this internship in the first place. And I would really appreciate it if I was able to be more involved. Um, and she can say, you know, more of what she wanted to gain from this experience that she hasn't been able to gain because she's not as involved as she'd like to be. So really just always in any situation, be able to advocate for yourself and say, this is what I signed up for. This is what I want. Um, you know, obviously in a respectful manner, but you know, if she's not unhappy, if she is unhappy, we don't want that, right? So it's up to her to go out of her way to make this experience more memorable um, and, and just more positive for her. So I would definitely encourage her to reach out and just say what's up and say how she wants to be more involved in what she's able to do should she be more involved. Thank you so much. I'll definitely tell her that. Awesome. Hi, I have a really quick question. Oh, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, just a little bit hard for me to hear me. So what is your what is your question? So basically, I already have some research experience. Right, and yeah. So my question is, how would you add? Add to the research experience? Your research if you... Yeah, so yeah, that's actually something that my huh? team depends on doing. Yeah. Too. There's a lot of... Um, like science fairs, I, I'm, I'm not sure if you said that or not. I can't really hear you super well. My computer has like, is really old and has like horrible fans. So we're not doing well over here. Um, but yeah, so a lot of um, science fairs will accept um, research things like this. Um, so I would definitely look into science fairs that you could apply to. Um, I don't know if, how it works. I know that there's the New York City Science and Engineering Fair, which my team will be applying or my research group will be applying um, into. Um, so I think that you can, um, there, th that is, I think that's the best way to continue uh, with what you've done, right? You wanna present what you've, what you've done to the world. Um, also like, you know, even in like, um, sometimes like there'll be like youth, you know, like STEM zines and stuff where you can oftentimes you'll be like, they'll allow you to like um, write about one of the projects that you've done before, one of the STEM projects that you've done, have done before. Um, so I think that you can say like, have this be, now that you've done this research, you always have it in your toolbox, right? And if there's ever an opportunity for you to show it off, whether that be in a magazine or a science fair, or even, I don't know, like literally, literally, maybe there's something at your school, right? Maybe there's a science fair at your school. You've done this work. So now it sticks with you forever. Just because the research part of it ended, it doesn't mean that the work isn't there anymore. So I would say keep your eyes open for opportunities where there might be a place for you to put um, or show off your research. Um, and yeah, sorry, if anyone has asked me anything in the chat, I like can't find I'm not good at reading things right now um if you've asked any question in the chat I would I we oh I guess we're 
we're about to be out of time. If anyone wants to ask like one more question, I'll, I'll also, I'm also gonna read through the chat um, into the next uh, thing going on. Um, but yeah, thank you all so much for joining me. Once again, that's my Instagram, please follow me. Um, or I would like it if you followed me, I feel like that makes sense to do so. Um, and that's my email if you have any specific questions that I don't answer. Um, oh, thank you guys, oh yay. Uh, um, thank you all so much for coming. Um, this was really fun. This is my first time ever doing anything like this. So hopefully <laughs> you guys liked it, I'm glad you did. Um, Oh, yay. Oh, yay. We love. Thank you. Awesome. Um, Hi, I have a really quick question. Yes. Hit me. So what age would you say that people should start looking for internships? That's a good question. I'm in Canada right now, and I'm... You're yeah. in what? You're what grade? Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm in grade 10. Grade 10. Okay. Going into grade 10. Yeah, I think that yeah. is... You're at a really the, age... Um, I would say that most research is normally able to be done for juniors and seniors in high school, but I think starting freshmen and sophomores is great. I mean, for me, I learned that I could take these prerequisite classes for the internship I now have. I could have been taking those prereq classes, you know, since I was a freshman. So sometimes when you're actually able to conduct the research, you want to be a little bit older or that's what the programs really are more targeting. But definitely I would say as early as, you know, freshman year, even eighth grade, low key, like why not? Um, but I think it's never too early to start looking for these opportunities. And then once again, you gotta, you want to be organized, right? So just keep track of literally anything that sparks your interest. Maybe it's not for you right now, but it might be for you later. Um, so yeah, I would say, I mean, definitely take this summer to, to do some research to find research. Makes sense. Thank you so much. Awesome. Where are my earrings from? That's a really great question. I honestly don't know. I've just like been having them for a minute there. Um, maybe Urban Outfitters, which like sucks now. Like we don't like Urban, so we're not going to support them. Um, but uh, yes. Okay, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to Izzy's really, really awesome workshop. Mm -hmm.